Hi guys, in this video we are going to be talking about enzymes. Um, I've already made uh, some videos covering the basics of enzymes, such as factors which can affect them, like um, concentration of enzyme or substrate, um, pH and temperature. Right, so I've already had those, uh, I've, I've already made those videos, so please refer to them. In this one, we're going to be focusing on um, two other factors that could also affect um, enzymes, and they are cofactors, and secondly, inhibitors, okay? Because if you're lucky, you get a straightforward question about the effect of concentration, temperature, or pH on an enzyme. If you're not so lucky, you might get something like something on, on these two other factors, which are um, a bit more complicated. And secondly, they could still involve um, experiments. So we're going to be looking at these two things. A, in terms of the theory, and some examples that you need to know about, and B, the experimental side of it. Because you could just as well get a question about some experimental results, maybe an unknown substance which might be a cofactor or it might be an inhibitor. How can you look at some data, you know, looking at the rate of an enzyme in the presence of unknown substance and say if it's a cofactor or an inhibitor? Or if you know, if, if the examiners are really mean, they might ask you to design an experiment to test whether something is a cofactor or an inhibitor. How would you go about doing that? All right, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, um, very briefly, the very, very most basics, enzyme plus a substrate. Remember, an enzyme is a protein plus a substrate, could be practically anything, gives you enzyme plus product, okay? And remember, we have in the middle the formation of this little thing called the enzyme substrate complex, all right? And remember also that there are two theories about how this could be happening, the lock and key model, the induced fit model, revise those things, they're the very basics, okay? Um, but essentially, if you have an enzyme, okay, if you have an enzyme, the substrate has a complementary shape, not the same shape. Be careful about that. Common mistake that the substrate has the same shape as the enzyme. The enzyme plus the substrate gives you the unchanged enzyme as a result of this catalysis and a product, something new. And the enzyme did that, okay? The enzyme catalyzed that reaction. Did the enzyme react? No, it didn't. It just made that reaction more likely to happen, thereby increasing the rate of the reaction. People, too many people saying speeding up the reaction, it needs to be increasing the rate of the reaction, okay? So this is the very basics of what we are looking at. And what we have are the two factors. Now, cofactors, are something which help or increase um, the rate of a reaction because some enzymes need a cofactor for them to be able to um, catalyze a reaction. So cofactors always increase the rate of product formation, increase the rate of a reaction. Whereas inhibitors, I shouldn't say make it go backwards, but inhibitors kind of um, prevent uh, product formation. They reduce the rate of product formation, okay? So we must bear this in mind that cofactors and inhibitors are like two faces of the same coin, all right? So we've got the enzyme substrate um, process, so enzyme catalyzes the change of the substrate into the product. Cofactor some enzymes need a cofactor for that to happen, in which case cofactors increase the rate of product formation. Inhibitors work in the opposite way. They prevent the enzyme from carrying out the, the catalysis of the reaction. 
and therefore they reduce the rate of product formation. All right, so cofactors and enzymes and inhibitors, that's why I'm talking about them together. Okay, right, so let's begin with cofactors then. Um, I showed you my diagram of an enzyme. I always do it something like this. Okay, so it's got an active site which is complementary to a substrate. So when the substrate um, fits into the active site, we get product formation, okay, plus enzyme. So we get our enzyme back again, and plus we have product. All right, so we've changed the substrate into the product, and then our, our enzyme remains as it is, pretty much, barring my slightly dodgy drawing of it. Okay, so that's our reaction. Where do cofactors fit in? Well, sometimes the enzyme, you know, it's a protein, it's got primary, secondary, tertiary, possibly even a quaternary structure. Sometimes that on its own is not enough to bind a substrate. How do we, um, how do we exemplify this? We can, we can show something, we can have something like this. So say on its own, the enzyme looks like that, all right? Um, it can't bind the substrate, or um, this is just an example, but it, the protein structure of the enzyme itself might not be enough for it to bind the substrate and carry out the reaction. In which case, we need something extra. We need something more to allow that enzyme to be able to bind the substrate or to bring the sub substrate or, or whatever, okay? So it might be attached to the enzyme itself. It might even be something that attaches itself to the substrate. Okay, and they maybe come along together and fit into the enzyme. Maybe that's not a great choice. Like that. Okay, maybe they come together. But the point being that sometimes the enzyme structure is not enough for it to carry out the reaction. It needs something more and that something more is what we call a cofactor. It's something that's not part of the original enzyme uh, structure, but it's needed to, for the enzyme to be able to carry out the reaction. And it's not a substrate because it doesn't get changed in the reaction. So it, you know, it's, it's still what it was before. It doesn't change either. All right, so the cofactor is not an enzyme because it doesn't carry out the reaction on its own. And it's not a substrate either because it doesn't change during the reaction. So we call it a cofactor, okay? It's needed for the enzyme to be able to carry out the catalysis of the reaction, okay? So let's just go back to this. I think this is a much better, th this gives you a better idea of what's going on, okay? Sometimes an enzyme needs a cofactor for it to be able to carry out the reaction. And that's what a cofactor is. And once you have this idea, you the next thing you need to know is that there are three types of cofactor. Okay? The first is called the coenzyme. Okay, it's, um, and it's pretty much kind of what I've shown here. The coenzyme is an organic um, an organic component which temporarily binds temporarily binds enzyme and they are non-protein okay non-protein so they're not they're not protein that they are still organic okay and they temporarily bind enzymes just some, in a similar way to what we have here, all right? So remember, coenzymes are organic, they are non-protein, they temporarily bind the enzyme to make the reaction more likely to happen, okay? Temporarily binds to the enzyme. That's coenzyme, right? So that's, let's just put that. Number one, coenzyme. Number two, is the prosthetic group so and we've come across this before for example the heme group in hemoglobin 
um, that's a prosthetic group because it's it's uh, something that is a permanent part of the protein structure. In this case, that protein is an enzyme, but sometimes even these proteins have um, a prosthetic group, a permanent part of the enzyme's structure. Okay, prosthetic group. Okay, right. Um, yeah. All right, now these are permanently bound, permanently bound to the enzyme, permanently bound to the enzyme. All right, so coenzymes temporarily bind to the enzyme just for the purpose of the reaction. Prosthetic groups are an essential part of that enzyme structure. All right. Okay, and remember these are, again, they are just coenzymes that are permanently bound. So whatever properties we ascribe to the coenzyme, essentially they are true for the prosthetic group as well, i.e. they are organic, they are non-protein, but the only difference is they are permanently bound to the enzyme. That's the only difference with the prosthetic group. Third and final, you have the inorganic inorganic ions all right so maybe like a calcium ion or a sodium ion something like that very kind of small ions in comparison to large molecules but they are the fact that they are charged might just help that you know and and if they associate to the right part of the enzyme it might just give the enzyme the right charge that the enzyme needs to bind a substrate okay so there we have it, our three types of cofactors. Remember what the differences are. Um, they are quite, you know, important differences, but and that means that they are more easy to remember. Okay, so coenzyme, remember that it's organic, uh, temporarily binding though, that's important. I don't know why I'm crossing these words out. Okay, temporarily binding, prosthetic groups, similar to coenzymes, however, they are permanently bound to the enzyme. And finally, we have inorganic ions, okay? All right. So, it might not, I mean, if, if a question like this comes up on cofactors and enzymes, it might not be obvious um, that what, what they are talking about is an inhibitor or a cofactor. Um, so you want to be looking for the clues, okay? First clue, is this thing increasing the rate of the reaction? If it is, it's likely to be a cofactor. Then you might be looking for other things. For example, um, what are its properties? Is it, is it a simple inorganic ion like zinc or calcium or sodium or potassium? Or is it something a bit more complex? If it is, it's likely to be a coenzyme or a prosthetic group. Is there a hint that it's not permanently bound to the um, enzyme itself? In that case, it's a coenzyme. If it's permanently bound prosthetic group, look for these clues and it will kind of help you identify what you're looking at. One side note, um, these cofactors are need, I mean, depending on the nature of what they are, often, we get them into our body, as you know, um, and we know them as vitamins in our, you know, as a dietary component. But usually, things that are vitamins or described as vitamins, usually um, you need them in the small quantities because they act as cofactors um, for enzymes. Okay, and you know, as we've said, they don't get used up in the reaction. So once the reaction happens, you know, they they are reproduced again. Um, and because of that, they are only needed in small quantities, okay? Just like enzymes, you don't need, um, if you've got one particular enzyme in the cell, you probably don't need loads and loads of that because one enzyme can carry out many, many, many reactions, okay? Okay, next we have inhibitors okay so just like we have cofactors that are required 
for some enzymes for them to be able to carry out a reaction um, and, and therefore they ultimately result in an increase in the substrate's conversion into product, we have inhibitors which kind of do the opposite job. They prevent product formation, they reduce product formation by reducing the activity of the enzyme. And now let's look at what kind of inhibitors you can have. Okay, so in terms of inhibitors, there are two main types. Okay, um, I'm sure you know what they are. They are the competitive, competitive, and so that's one, and two, non competitive, competitive. Okay, which is not to say reversible or irreversible, okay? Either one can be reversible or irreversible. Know this, okay? Right, so let's go back to our enzyme then. Okay, remember, I'm not going into too much depth here. I just want to get the basics down. Right, so enzyme, substrate, as usual. Let's not overcomplicate things, all right? Enzyme plus substrate, if that interaction happens, if they form the enzyme substrate complex, if they are going to form the enzyme substrate complex, the reaction is then inevitable. It's gonna happen. Well, not reaction, but you know, the change of the substrate into the product, okay? I'm gonna run out of space here, go this way. Yeah, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that enzyme changes size, but what can you do? Right, okay, so enzyme plus substrate, enzyme substrate complex, enzyme plus product. Okay, right, so this is what's going on. No inhibitors are around. Now let's look at what competitive inhibitors do. Competitive inhibitors, they compete with the substrate for the active site, all right? Burn that sentence into your brain, all right? Competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate for the active site. So they usually have um, a similar shape to the substrate, all right? Now remember, what, this is where your language becomes really important. The enzyme has a complementary shape to the substrate and vice versa. But competitive inhibitors have a similar shape to the substrate. Because of that, there's a competition between the two for the active site. Okay? And so if you have lots of substrate, as soon as you add even one molecule or one uh, whatever it is of the um, competitive inhibitor, you have then reduced the chance of the substrate occupying the active site. And the more you increase the concentration of the competitive inhibitor, the more chance that the competitive inhibitor is going to occupy the active site rather than the, sub, you know, the actual substrate occupying the active site. Okay, so what we do then is we reduce, we reduce the formation of the proper enzyme substrate complex. All right, so the more competitive inhibitor we have, so let's just say that the competitive inhibitor is here. If it's taking up the active site, the actual substrate cannot occupy the active site. We therefore have less, and, and be careful about what you're saying here, you know, listen to the words that I'm using. We're not blocking, uh, we're not, you know, completely stopping the formation of the enzyme substrate complex, but the presence, so even if you have a little bit of inhibitor, it's going to cause a reduction in the formation of the enzyme substrate complex. And because we're going to have less of this formed, we are going to have less product formed. So the rate, and it depends what the question is asking, if they're asking for the volumes, if they're asking for 
extent of change refer to these things all right so we are forming less product because we are the active site is being occupied by the competitive inhibitor okay so ultimately remember what we talked about inhibitors reduce product formation and you see how this is in exact opposite to the cofactor. The presence of the cofactor was actually essential for the, for the um, enzyme to catalyze the reaction. And so it would lead to the increase in product formation. The presence of the inhibitor is actually resulting in less, and this is a key point, less enzyme substrate complex formation or maybe a lower rate of enzyme substrate complex formation. And because of that, we have less product formation or a lower rate of product formation. You see the language that I'm using, that's what you've got to be saying. Okay, um, right, so that was the competitive inhibitor. It, 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 act, it occupies the active site and therefore prevents the actual substrate from occupying the active site and so on. All right, so we get less product formation. Okay, so how, what does this look like? That's very important. So let me just make a little space here. So I'll just look here, we are talking about the competitive inhibitor. Now on a graph, what you will see is the increasing substrate concentration and over here, we might have something like rate, or actually, no, not rate, but product, product formation, okay? Whatever that might be. Now, remember, enzyme reactions can be measured in very different ways. So don't get confused if it doesn't say product all the time. Maybe the reaction is a color change reaction. So here we'll be looking at extent of color change, or maybe we'll be measuring the frequency of light at a particular wavelength. Or the reaction might cause a pH change, in which case we might be measuring pH here. Okay, or maybe it produces a gas, in which case we'll be measuring volume of gas here. All right, or maybe it turns the mixture cloudy. So in, in which case we might be looking at percent of light transmission. Yeah, all, these are all different ways of measuring enzyme reactions, and you've got to be looking out for that, all right? Fine. So once you know, okay, the enzyme changes the pH, all right? Changes in pH is how we are measuring the reaction. Oh, the enzyme causes a color change. Okay, I'm looking for a color change. That's how I'm going to measure my reaction. Look for these things. Anyway, so product formation could be measured in different ways. So normally, as we increase the substrate, our rate of reaction, our rate of product formation increases until we reach a point where we've saturated all our active sites and, and the further increases in substrate concentration don't cause any increase in the enzyme substrate formation and therefore product formation is, you know, not stopped but it stays at a constant level because further increases in substrate don't make the reaction occur any faster because all the enzymes are working at at a maximal rate anyway. Okay, now what the effect of the competitive inhibitor is that it reduces, so I'll do that in red, it reduces the rate of the reaction. Okay, so if, so and this line represents the presence of the inhibitor in the experiment, okay, and what the experiment might be is a series of concentrations of substrate. Okay, so here I've got substrate concentration one, substrate concentration two, substrate concentration three, substrate concentration four, substrate concentration five. As you can see, my substrate concentrations are increasing, but I'm keeping the volume the same. And in each case, I've got a little the same volume and concentration of inhibitor. So the inhibitor is always present in the same amounts, but as we go this way, I'm increasing the concentration of the substrate and adding the enzyme in, 
enzyme, 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 and measuring, you know, maybe the volume of gas that's produced in a minute. Yeah, or the extent of color change in a minute, whatever. All right, so this gives me a readout of the product formation. And the effect of the competitive inhibitor is that it lowers the product formation. But the more substrate I add, the more chance that the substrate is going to occupy the active site. And what we can say is that the substrate then outcompetes the inhibitor. Okay, so if I've got loads of substrate, and only a few molecules of inhibitor, for example, all right, then the probability is that the substrate is going to occupy the active site and not the inhibitor because there's just simply so many more of the substrate molecules. Okay, so as we increase the substrate concentration, the effect of the inhibitor becomes less and less and less until um, it has practically no uh, effect, almost, yeah? The fact that it's there means that it's always going to have some effect, which means that that line never really ever reaches the black line, which is no enzyme, uh, sorry, no inhibitor. So, no inhibitor plus inhibitor. Okay? So with the competitive inhibitor, because there's a competition between the enzyme and, uh, sorry, the substrate and the inhibitor for the active site, the more you increase the substrate concentration, the more substrate will outcompete the inhibitor for the active site, more enzyme substrate complex will be formed, therefore more product will be formed. Okay? And I hope that makes sense. All right? Now, let's look at the other type of inhibitor now. So our next type of inhibitor is the non-competitive non inhibitor, right? Now, as the name suggests, it does not compete with the substrate for the active site. Okay, does not compete with the substrate for the active site. So its shape is largely nothing to do with the substrate, okay? Okay, nothing to do with the substrate. So non-competitive, remember competitive meant that it's competing for the active site. Non-competitive means it does not compete for the active site. It actually binds a region away from the active site, all right? and could be anywhere in this example it's here okay so this is called the allosteric site and what that means is if something binds here it's likely to change the shape of the enzyme all right so this is our non-competitive inhibitor when it binds the enzyme it changes the shape of the enzyme so that the enzyme can no longer bind the substrate. There's some more words that you need to burn into your brain, okay? When the non-competitive inhibitor binds the enzyme, it changes the uh, tertiary structure, you can say, or the shape of the active site, so that the enzyme cannot bind the substrate. If the enzyme cannot bind the substrate, again, we have less formation of the enzyme substrate complex and therefore again we have less product formed okay right but in this case the line is very different so if i did the same experiment increasing concentrations of substrate remember same volumes though and I have the presence of the inhibitor or the absence of the inhibitor. I, so therefore I'm doing the experiment twice. Once like this, once without the inhibitor. Okay. 
Okay, so once without the inhibitor, remember the enzyme has to be there also. Same volume and concentration in each case. Right? So, in this case, if I have my non-competitive inhibitor, and I do this experiment, increasing substrate concentration with and without the presence of the inhibitor, in that case the line looks like that. It does decrease the product formation, but in contrast to the competitive inhibitor, the non-competitive inhibitor, the substrate concentration, increasing that has no effect on the rate of the reaction. So remember, with the, um, with the competitive inhibitor, increasing substrate concentration eventually caused the rate of reaction to rise again because the substrate was then outcompeting the competitive inhibitor for the active site. But here, regardless of however much you increase the substrate concentration, we're not going to return this, the shape of that um, active site back to normal as long as this competitive a non-competitive inhibitor is bound. So it doesn't matter how much more substrate I add, doesn't affect the working of the inhibitor. Okay, hope you can see that. So, therefore, more I increase the substrate concentration, the, the rate of product formation is always lower. Okay? Um, it's not a competition between the substrate and the inhibitor in this case because the inhibitor is not binding at the active site. The inhibitor is binding somewhere else, therefore no competition. Okay? Right. Okay, so I hope that's making sense. Non-competitive inhibitor, competitive inhibitor, they are binding in different places and therefore they are working in different places. But remember, this has got nothing to do with reversible or irreversible, okay? Your competitive inhibitor could be reversible or irreversible, in which case its line might look different on the graph there. Um, and the non-competitive inhibitor could be reversible and irreversible. So it could be binding permanently or it could just pop off, enzyme, active site, shape returns back to normal, substrate can bind again. All right. Okay, so that is the two types of inhibitors. Now what we're going to look at is next um, a more detailed um, look at how we do these experiments on enzymes. Okay, that's really important. It, uh, it often forms um, quite a large chunk of marks on the F212 paper, so we're going to look at that. Hi guys, just a side note. Um, regarding questions that can come up about inhibitors, they can usually, you know, um, OCR loves to kind of mix topics together and, um, you know, which is fair enough. You know, you should be in command of your knowledge and and be able to appreciate the kind of bigger concepts here. So one of the important concepts here is that inhibitors are actually quite important um, for the normal working of enzymes. So if you want to control a biochemical reaction in the body, it does need to be inhibited. Also, medicines, drugs, they are usually some form of inhibitor, some form of uh, a molecule that's modifying a protein's uh, function, often as an inhibitor. So drugs, um, medicines, and the whole idea of the, you know, the uh, specific interaction between the two and the fact that, uh, you know, resistance to drugs can often be a result of mutations that might change the shape of the enzyme so that it no longer binds the inhibitor, those ideas. So this enzyme, for example, could be in a bacteria, in a, in a bacterium cell or some kind of pathogen. 
and if, if there's a drug it might be working by inhibiting the enzyme but if that bacterium becomes resistant to that drug probably is because it's had a mutation that changes the shape of this enzyme so that they don't have that specific interaction anymore with that drug the drug is no longer the right shape to bind the enzyme okay just putting it out there just in case it helps <laughs>